This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 128 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Maisie Eddings all about neurodiversity in fiction. So you are going to notice a difference in my audio today because I am still without internet. So I am recording from the co-working space uh, in kind of one of these semi-soundproof audio, not audio, (laughs) meeting booths. So you are going to hear some ambiance in the background and potentially uh, some doors closing and uh, people, I don't know, meeting, working, doing all that good stuff. So I apologise for that this week, but uh, next week I am due to have my internet put back in on Monday. So I should be back in the uh, normal, well, you know, occasionally kid-infested office uh, and workspace where I normally record. So bear with me this week. So as I said, I am talking to Maisie Eddings today um, and we're going to be talking all about neurodiversity in fiction and I really, really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. It was fascinating to get her perspective um, and I hope that you find it useful and interesting. But first to last week's question, which was how comfortable are you with writing sex scenes? Now because of how we are uh, recording, the days that we are recording and scheduling, so I record now on Thursdays and these... um, the question and the old episode goes up on Wednesday so it's not giving people a huge amount of time to respond which I think is one of the reasons for um, the lower uh, sort of number of comments um, however we I ran a poll this week on Instagram uh, asking if you liked um, writing sex scenes and um, the so interestingly it is uh, 52% of you do not so we've had like 29 30 responses something like that and um uh, 52% said no and 48% said yes very interesting to me and you know this is not this number of responses is not statistically significant but um for the males who had responded all of them said no um and so anyone who had said yes was female um or or non-binary um so i thought that was very interesting i don't know what that says i don't have any data (laughs) like any statistical data but i did think that was interesting um so yes thank you to everybody who voted uh i might actually because we do a poll every week i might share these every week now actually just to see uh just to share some of the results um that you guys are are voting on so this week's question is how comfortable are you with uh, writing about difference so what i mean by that is is a character who is different to you in any way that you would like maybe it's their race or maybe it's it's their mental health status or maybe it's their sexuality um but how comfortable are you writing about difference book recommendation this week is a graphic novel it's a sapphic one um it's young adult and it's called girl from the sea by molly knox ostertag i have probably butchered that surname so i apologize but the links will be in the show notes um i read this in one sitting i thought it was so cute it was so lovely it was really warming it was kind of like a bittersweet um ending but it was oh it was just so sweet and lovely and i loved the characters and i loved the drawings and i loved the moral of the story and yeah i just thought it was wonderful 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 um definitely one that you can consume in in one sitting so yeah okay so in personal update and news this week um I've been struggling, I'll be honest. Like, I've been struggling for a little while. Um, So, obviously, I have finished uh, Trey and Sirens. Trey is with the editor. Sirens is... um, I'm just... uh, In fact, one of the proofs should be arriving today. So, that one is all ready. Um, And it's been really hard to start the next thing. So, I've sort of had a couple of full starts. I have been because I want to do a course I want to do my next non-fiction book and I want to do my next fiction book and having three on the go is tricky and not really conducive to getting any of them done Uh, but I also don't like prioritizing so (laughs) it's been really hard for me because I want to deliver all of them 
Um, that said, I have now booked a coaching session on Monday, um, and I am hoping that I should sort of have a shift in my mindset after that and be able to bring the decision hammer down. Um, oh, there we go. Someone's making coffee. <laughs> the background it's the ambience darling i hope you enjoy it uh, so as this airs it will be wednesday the 9th of march which is the day before my birthday yay happy birthday me so in uh, in order to celebrate that i am giving a flash sale i'm going to be 35 on the 10th of march and so uh, i am giving you all 35 percent off uh, my books, my courses, um, and you, that's if you buy direct, that's not um, on the stores. So if you want a book or a course, then you can get 35% off this week. And you can get that by using the code BIRTHDAY35. And I will put links in the show notes to both my um, web shop and to my course web shop as well. Um, okay, what else? I think that's probably it. Um, Yeah, until... I mean, so here's the other thing. I'm in this difficult spot because a lot of the stuff that I need to do requires input and I'm a bitch and I very rarely give myself the time (laughs) to do the input and the planning. Um, So I think I told you all that I reworked the outline for The Scent of Death, but like I haven't done it in enough detail. So when I came to work on it this week... I froze up because I hadn't really given myself the headspace to start working on that and I didn't have enough detail in the new outline so I really I think I need a week off well not a week off but a week see this is the thing I can't even bring myself to think of that kind of work as work which is so annoying I don't know what's wrong with me um but I need to have a week where I give myself like no work no meetings so that I can one read all of the books that I need to input for the course and the non-fiction book and then also uh, give myself the headspace to do more detail on the on the new outline um yes so I think that is probably it oh the rebel author diaries is also on pre-order now um it's on pre-order everywhere except amazon because uh, as i mentioned before um amazon doesn't allow pre-orders through aggregates and we are going through drafted digital because drafted digital will handle all of the payment splitting options for the anthology and if you follow me on instagram by the time this airs we should almost be through the author reveals we should have revealed i think nine or ten authors by the time uh, this airs so do head on over to uh, my instagram at sasha black author where you can see all of um, the authors in the anthology their stories their favorite line from the story a little bit about them uh, and all of that good stuff we going to be running an Instagram challenge using the hashtag rebel diaries uh, and we will be sharing the grid and all of the prompts for that so do come and join in Uh, it should be fun should be cheeky uh, and there'll be lots of yeah silly fun things on Instagram and uh, I'll also be running some live events uh, in the Facebook group rebel authors and uh, so those will be one will be on the launch day which is the 30th of March and then there should be two others and we're just finalizing the dates uh, for those lives but come and join the Facebook group if you're not already in there because um, you'll get all the updates in there okay that really is it from me Uh, I am going to do the rebel of the week okay so the rebel of the week this week is Jeff Jeff says I have what some might consider a reverse rebellion in 2010 I retired early after working for 20 years in high tech for two big companies. I spent 11 years exploring my other interests and started writing a few years ago. I have produced a peck of partial projects, co-written half of a sci-fi trilogy, um, most of a piece of historical fiction set in the recovery recovery of the Black Death, and half a dozen... um, other projects I started but struggled to land. Along the way I have learned how to get my anxiety and depression under control, therapy, meds and exercise for the win, and discovered that I get the most satisfaction working in teams. I just did my Clifton strengths and four of the five are in the strategic thinking domain. So now I am going back to uh, to work at one of the big companies. Oh, interesting. I used to work uh, for but with uh, new tools and perspectives uh, and writing as a creative outlet. We are each on our own journey. Oh, I find that so fascinating. I love that reverse rebellion. Um yeah, look, and this is the thing, right? We you're so right, Jeff. We each and uh, each one of us has our own journey and writing full-time is not the goal for everyone. 
and that's okay. Like writing full time or even being self-employed full time, regardless of the what's of the type of business that you run is not for everyone. There is a reason why less than 25% of the UK are self-employed, right? That means 75% of people um, aren't aren't the right sort of people to work self-employed because either it, it's too much pressure, either they don't enjoy it, they need teams or people, um, or, you know, like a, a, a host of other different reasons why you may or may not be suited to self-employment. And there's nothing to stop anybody being self-employed and employed. I was that for a long time. Um, and yeah, so like we all have to follow our own journeys and whatever your journey is, it is valid, it is right, as long as it is making you happy. Happy. that is the most important thing we are on this planet for such a short time we might as well be happy whilst we are here so um if you would like to be a rebel of the week please do send in your story i did check this morning we only have a few um so i always appreciate when you do send in those rebel stories it can be any kind of rebellion big small or something in between you can rebel uh, you can rebel your story too you can email your rebel story to becca on uh, the email address rebel author podcast at gmail.com Thank you and welcome to Lisa Fioresi. Um, I am very grateful for you joining me on Patreon. Uh, and if anybody else would like to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, as well as a raft of bonus content, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I am deeply grateful to all of my patrons. Um, you guys, you're amazing. I love the community that we've built. Uh, we did have to postpone the uh, bittersweet Tating Game Masterclass. However, as this episode airs, we will be doing it this evening. Uh, so we're doing that on the 9th of March now because uh, I had nowhere to do it uh, without the internet. So yes thank you and uh, yeah there are always other bits and bobs that get uh, revealed or, or sent to you guys in patreon so please do come and join me it really does mean a lot and also it helps to keep the show running too but just to let you guys know as you know i've had no internet for ooh, almost three weeks now uh, by the time we get it on monday it will be three weeks and so that has meant that i have had to record podcasts in unusual locations one of which is my mum's office uh, where she doesn't have carpet and uh, doesn't have a a wall of paper books to muffle the audio so I am afraid that at least four episodes over the next couple of months will have a slightly tinny audio I can't really do anything about that however the episodes are jam-packed full of great tips and advice so I hope you will bear with me I hope you'll stay listening uh, because come Monday all of the episodes going forward will be back to normal so yes this is one of those episodes obviously <laughs> that's why I'm mentioning it uh, so yeah all right, I think that is enough waffling from me. Let's get on with the episode. Hello, and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I am joined by Maisie Eddings. Maisie is a neurodiverse author, dentist, and most importantly, stage mum to her cats, Yaya and Zadie. She can most often be found reading romance novels under her weighted blanket and asking her boyfriend to bring her snacks. She's made it her personal mission in life to destigmatize mental health issues and write love stories for every brain, which I love. With roots in Ohio and North Carolina, she now calls Philadelphia home. Hello and welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> you are most welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. Would you like to start by telling everyone a little bit about you and kind of how you got to where you are today? What is your journey? Yeah, um, I mean, you covered a lot of it in the bio, but um, I am... Like you said, I'm a dentist and an author. Um, my debut novel, A Brush With Love, comes out uh, March 1st of this year. Um, so I guess four days from now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've so I kind of um, stumbled my way into, um, sorry, my cat's just jumping in here. Um, I stumbled my way into writing. Um, it's always something that I loved doing and it was always just like a huge passion of mine, but I never kind of had the belief or confidence that I could make um, a living out of it or like, you know, even that I was good enough to like pursue something like that. Um, and so, you know, kind of as one does, I, I pursued a different path from what I actually wanted. And, um, and I studied, you know, sciences in, um, in college. And then I ended up going into dental school um, to be a dentist. And then during my first year, I had 
a really big quarter life crisis. Um, I almost said midlife crisis. So like fingers crossed, that's not the case, but um, yeah, I, I had a quarter life crisis and I was just like, is this, is this what I want out of life? I was really stressed. I was like the most anxious and depressed I've, I've ever been. Um, and I really turned to um, first reading romance novels. I was reading like a book a day because I had such bad insomnia and it was such a balm. And then I got these idea, these characters popped into my head and they just wouldn't shut up. Um, and it ended up being the first book that I finished. Like I had so many started drafts of books, um, but this was the first one that I fully finished. And, and I just decided to take a leap of faith and pursue it. Um, yeah. And now I do both full time, um, which is a lot, but I'm very grateful for, for it and loving every second. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, I love it. I, I love hearing like how different, I don't think I've heard two authors with the same like journey um, to, to authordom, if you like. Um, okay, so we're going to dive into detail about your book, which I got to read and I loved. Um, but would you like to take a minute to tell everyone a little bit more about your book before we start? Yeah, it's a contemporary romantic comedy um, that follows Harper and Dan, who are two um, dental students, and they trade fillings for feelings. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love um, a bit of cheeky wordplay. <laughs> <laughs> so dorky. Um, as they they navigate the um, kind of like the the emotions and confusion that come with being an adult and not really sure what that means. Um, it's, it's a romance and they, you know, they have a romantic journey together, but I think the book also really highlights um, learning to, to love yourself and who you are. Um, the main character, Harper, has an anxiety disorder and at the start of the novel, she has like a lot of internalized ableism around that and like just a lot of kind of shame and things um, that she eventually starts to overcome through the book. Um, and yeah, it's, it's about like learning to open yourself up to being loved, learning to love yourself where, where you're at in your journey. Um, and then also just kind of pursuing life passions and stuff. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, that was like the representation in it. Um, I absolutely loved. So I, um, although I don't like, I'm not on meds, I have various <laughs> varying degrees of anxiety mm -hmm. and I when like when I was at university and I was really stressed I like collapsed and was like rushed to hospital because I had like an irregular heartbeat and just because it was literally I, I I forget now if it was panic attacks or like anxiety attacks or whatever it was but like it was a you know it's a problem and still now like I get occasionally like breathing issues just where like stress because yeah. this world this world is so stressful. I know I, I was right? like oh I wonder why like yeah the world <laughs> running a business Hell, like yeah <laughs> you but, know um, but yeah but I loved it and I loved the representation and so like I'm gonna ask you a few questions about that but mm -hmm. before we go into kind of the mental health side and, and representing and writing that, I wanted to ask, um, cause like, even before I'd read your bio, like I read the book and then I came to like research you and, um, I figured that you had to be a dentist because there was, <laughs> it was so realistic. Like the detail <laughs> in the book was so realistic. I was like, there's no fucking way this girl is not a dentist. <laughs> you know, like, right <laughs> you don't put that you know, well I have never and look, look this is clearly my uh, subconscious bias assuming dentists don't want to, to write books but the, the question I'm trying to get to is um how did you find that balance because there is a balance between like realism and like fictional worlds and not adding too much information that it becomes information dumping about a specialist topic but also making it feel rich and vivid and full of depth so like yeah t t talk to me about that you know okay so I wrote this when I was in my first year so in a lot of ways like there there was a lot of stuff that I still didn't know right like <laughs> at the, as I was it's funny because like as I was going through certain like modules and lessons um it ended up being reflected in the book a little bit. Like there's this part, like a sexy part about anatomy and muscles and stuff. And I ended up like, it was almost like a study guide. Like I was like, okay, how can I make this interesting enough that like, I'll remember it. And then also put it into this romance novel. Um, so did you have I to make the molds as well? Yeah, oh my God, <laughs> dude, I cannot even tell you what a nightmare, like 
if you want to know what purgatory is, <laughs> it's a it's a dental school on the day that you learn to take impressions. Like it is everybody, it is the most like sensory overload, chaotic thing. Like it's awful. <laughs> Um, yeah. So like all of that is very, and, and I wasn't exaggerating either when like I was saying that puke is like a huge occupational hazard for what we do. Um, but yeah, I think in a lot of ways I was almost sick of being in dental school, like your world becomes really small. Um, and so it becomes the size of somebody's mouth. Like you live, breathe, eat teeth, not eat teeth, but, um, you know what I mean? (laughs) But you, yeah, you're, it's like kind of all that you're thinking about and studying and all of this. And so I kind of wanted to pivot or get an escape, but I also thought there was something fun about playing with this world and something like really cathartic, um, having these characters be in the, in this dental world and, and kind of winning, right? Cause like I was at having low points. And so I was watching them really win. And so when it came to like figuring out what to keep in there, dentistry is not sexy. Everybody kind of hates the dentist. And like, I recognize this and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do justice to the career and like, try to make it a little bit interesting. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I also like wanted to be respectful to people that have dental phobia and everything and like not make it too, too much. Um, because I think that's like a super valid, like I totally understand why people experience that. And so I wanted to make it accessible as best as possible. And so, yeah, it was more just like anything I found interesting in school, I added in there and then everything else was like, well. <laughs> well, I think you nailed the balance because it was like just enough that I was like, oh, this is an interesting fact that I can store and input for later. And like, you know, like when you have those general knowledge pub quiz quizzes or whatever, <laughs> and you can be like, oh, well, I know exactly how that, yeah, yeah like. That's what it kind of felt like. It was like just the right amount of uh, detail. Okay, so I wanted to talk about mental health. Mm -hmm. Let's say an author is a new author and they they would like to approach writing their story and and include an aspect of like mental health. What how do they approach that? What should they take into account? What do they need to keep in mind, like in order to be both respectful, but also representative and inclusive and yeah all of that good stuff yeah and I think you know there's there's such a fine balance with it um I I wrote about mental health from my own experiences like I I was diagnosed with an anxiety disorder when I was 12 I've been on medication for pretty much just as long like I'm autistic I have ADHD like just all kinds of fun stuff rattling up around in there and so a lot of um a lot of like Harper's experience and like her, her manifestations of anxiety um, were similar to what I have experienced in my own like battles with anxiety and mental health. Um, But I think for somebody that's looking to approach it, one thing that I advocate for is I, I don't like seeing people kind of fall into like the almost like trauma porn trap, right? Where it's like the whole crux of a person's being revolves around their mental illness because that does a disservice um, to people that experience it. Like, you know, it's, it's a facet um, of like who I am, but I'm also you know, I'm, I, I'm an artist, I'm a runner, like there's different components to a person and a mental illness is never just the crux of somebody's being. Um, and so I think that's really important. And so also it's, it's okay to like tap into your own experiences. So if, if you are somebody that suffered from a mental health issue or something like tapping into your lived experience is a beautiful like wealth of information to approach a story. Um, And if you haven't experienced that, I think it's super, like, it's very, very crucial to speak with somebody that has experienced it. So you can understand, and and multiple people too. So you can get a grasp of, of how, how it plays a role in somebody's life instead of just like putting kind of societal assumptions into Mm -hmm. a character when, when diving into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the other important thing is that like, you can be with five people who all have Mm. panic disorder or anxiety disorders and each of them it will appear and manifest differently so Mm -hmm. like one person's yeah Yeah. one one person's illness is not the same as as like another person's illness um and yeah I completely agree about the not letting it be the thing or like Mm -hmm. the whole aspect like as a queer woman it drives me nuts when Mm -hmm. like 
the character is made to be queer and that yeah. is like the everything about them I'm like guys I know no, like this I'm, is I'm queer I'm too and like yeah. when I see that I'm just like this isn't the point like yeah <laughs> exactly exactly let us have joy please <laughs> exactly um and the other thing that drives me fucking bananas it li- this one literally drives me wild so much so that there's a whole chapter in one of my um writing craft books on it is when people give villains a mental health disorder and they mm. make the mental health disorder the cause for the bad behavior and i'm like oh my god shall we just discriminate against everybody right yeah. now shall we it's um, so evilist yeah <laughs> isn't it isn't it just yeah. like um, yeah, I that that is like the bane for me. That is the worst yeah. kind of villain. Um, so and the worst kind of writing because it's just yes. not true. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like yeah. you say, okay. ableist and all of the rest of it. So right, I'm gonna get off my soapbox now. Um, no, I love it. <laughs> Um, okay so how can an author research a mental health issue like effectively are there like what are the different elements like meds or symptoms or, like what what kind of stuff should somebody be google not googling but you know like mm-hmm. going to a mental health clinic or, or asking people or like yeah what are the different things they need to take into account I think so I think it's important that you have to feel if you're going to talk about the subject in your work, you have to feel comfortable discussing it with people in real life that either experience it or if you experience it, you know, having people that you can have a dialogue with. I think that's really important. Um, And okay, this is kind of like a weird I think this is weird and I don't know if it's going to be controversial, but like, I find that Reddit is actually a huge resource to look at people's experiences. Um, I know it's like not reliable. It's obviously not like, you know, a meta analysis or anything like that, but there's like, you know, huge forums where people collectively who are having different experiences with anxiety or depression, like can talk about what they're going through. And it's kind of, you know, there are these little safe bubbles on the internet where people can like discuss their experiences with it and then also talk about things that might help or you know didn't work for them and everything and it's kind of just like a very um raw and like unfiltered place to look for that and obviously it's not like the end all be all and that's why it's kind of like you know a weird answer but I do think that that's a great place to like you know, get, get a sense of like what people might be experiencing, but then on, you know, the flip side, I think it's absolutely crucial to have kind of a fundal fundamental understanding of, of the science behind why, um, people experience the symptoms that they do, like why, why anxiety attacks are triggered or, um, you know, what depression physically manifests as, because we so often just think of them as like, just a state of being in your brain, but there is just a full body experience with what's going on. Um, yeah, due diligence, I just think is super important um, in your research too. And and looking broadly as well. And, and like you touched on ex- or looking at other people's experiences too and, and, and understanding that. Yeah, so my, my sort of educational background is in psychology. Mm. So I have a degree and a master's in psychology. And this oh. is like, yeah, I love this topic of conversation. Mm. I like it's like my wheelhouse and I get geeky about it. Mm. Um and like one of the other things that I think is really um important that people take into account is that we don't always suffer with all of the symptoms all of the time Mm -hmm. like that is a common mistake that I think people make um Mm -hmm. but yeah just like some of the other things are like symptoms um medications um and treatments like Mm -hmm. because not all of of, like it's not always about drugs it's not always about not drugs it's not always about Mm -hmm. you know there were so many different things so like yeah uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I think it's like looking holistically too at people and like understanding that yeah like you're saying like some things will work for for certain people but you you can't go into the with this preconceived notion of like this is what you know an anxious person is or this is what a bipolar person is like you have to have you have to understand that there's like a human and there's nuance to it in in everything and I love what you said about what can trigger an anxiety attack or Mm. panic attack because it's not like sometimes it can be really random or like yeah. out of nowhere or like sometimes you just you just you just don't know like yeah. and yeah anyway okay um so how can authors make the representation of mental health realistic mm-hmm. um you had some really gorgeous visceral 
like and vivid descriptions about what anxiety does to the body. So I wanted to like talk about this and like if you've got any tips for writers about how to do that, how to do it realistically. Um, yeah, like craft tips kind of there as well. Yeah, um, it was really important when I was writing it. Um, I think like a, a huge part of me wanted um, maybe to feel feel seen um, in in my like physical feelings with anxiety and stuff like that, because it can be so like, it can be so physically painful. Um, but outwardly people don't maybe recognize that anything's happening. Um, and so I think I kind of wanted to honor that experience too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to me, it was just really important to like tap into my body and be mindful. And it was almost scary at times because it was like, you know, it forced me to look at like, what is actually happening to me when I experience this, this panic or this anxiety, um, you know, like where, where am I feeling the painful spots or like what, you know, what's my stomach doing? What's my heart doing? Um, because I wanted to put it into words for people that might not have experienced that, but can like relate to other, you know, other, um, manifestations of it that they've experienced in some other way. Um, yeah. And so I, I do think like, I, I think when looking at, um, when looking at like mental health and mental illness and like how people experience that, um, it's important to tap into all five senses too, because again, like it's easy to get caught up in thinking it's just like this, this state of mind or like, you know, this, you know, depression, like a blue cloud or something like that, but you know, everything is affected. Your, your hearing's affected. Like even the words that you hear people saying like are morphed, right? Because like you kind your brain like kind of twists it a little bit. And like, um, you know, when, when you're anxious, your bones might hurt and things like that. And so um, I think just looking at it, for, like I said, from just um, all five senses, like almost um, a sensory experience when putting it on the page can make it more um, accessible to people that haven't necessarily experienced that exact situation. Mm. Have you... Um ever heard of the emotion thesaurus by Angela Ackerman and Becky Puglisi. Yes. Yeah. I love you, what, what you were saying kind of reminded me um, a little bit of like um yeah of 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 their book. I I love mm -hmm. they've been on the show as well actually. In fact oh. both of them have been on separately. Um but uh yeah I love their thesaurus because it has those vis visceral and internal kind of um like descriptions and like ideas and stuff for for different feelings and emotions and not necessarily like mental health disorders but I think you mm -hmm. can get ideas from the book mm -hmm. like you can take some of those visceral word descriptions and kind of yeah. play off of them and 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 yeah like use yeah. them so yeah if, you, if listeners don't have a copy of that book highly recommend it oh it's amazing it yeah I like I whip that bad boy out all the time <laughs> me too me too <laughs> yeah um, what mistakes do you see people making when writing about mental health? I think like, you know, not to be a broken record, but the big thing is just kind of falling into ableist traps or just kind of, you know, like these, these lazy tropes where it's like, um, before before you go into that just in case anybody doesn't understand what ableism is. Oh, yeah. Would, yeah. Just because I don't, yeah, I don't know how, di how versed everybody will be. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Um, ableism is just kind of, eh, well, you might even be able to get a better definition than I can, but from, from my understanding of it, it's this, um, kind of like paradigm or, um, set of standards that we have as a society where we view neurotypical people and non-disabled people, um, you know, as like the outline and then everything else outside of that is in, in a lot of ways, like, talked about as less than or as something to feel like shame about um so like I don't know is that am I do you feel like I'm getting it with that yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it is like you know it's it's discrimination against mm -hmm. people who are not fully able-bodied yeah. um in the same way that homophobia is yeah. you know discrimination against somebody who's queer or racism mm -hmm. is discrimination about a person of color um yeah and but it's I think ableism is really sinister because mm -hmm. it is one of the lesser talked about issues. Mm -hmm. I feel, I don't know. That's my personal feeling that it gets talked about less. Yeah. Um, and actually like it is no lesser than any of the other uh, 
not I was going to say phobias but you know like homophobia racism yeah. you know isms mm-hmm. all, all of all of the rest yeah. of them um it's no less of an issue um yeah. so yeah I just wanted to yeah anyway sorry um I interrupt you do, I don't do you want me to say the question again uh no no, no I can just okay. pick up from there yeah so and like I, as you were saying like it's it's these um it's these really micro things too, that in so many ways exclude, um, disabled people from, from like the rest of society, right? Like it cuts them off and yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it, it can be really traumatic to like go through life and like experience that constantly. Um, but when writing about mental health, I do feel like it can be, you know, a common trap to, like you said, I mean, perfect example of making your villain um, mentally ill. And that's the crux of like their evilness, right? Because it's equating mental illness with, with being evil. Um, or, you know, this, this concept that that's like the entire reason or like the, the driving force of a story. I don't think that that's a fair representation of like the fullness um, of life that like disabled people experience. Um, and I don't, I don't, it doesn't do justice to, to living with um, a mental illness or being neuro um, neurodiverse or anything like that. Um, and then just also um, being lazy about the representation, like, you know, as you've mentioned, like just doing a quick Google search and taking the top 10, you know, symptoms of bipolar disorder and having your character exemplify every single one of them at a level 10. You know, it's just like, you're you're just kind of sticking your characters into these stereotypes that, that lack the nuance of, of actually living the experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, I suppose my next question which I haven't sent you in advance, but you kind of made me think about it, is like, what do you say to those authors who are afraid to include it? Because I think like we do have this internalized ableism. Even mm-hmm. I do. And, mm-hmm. you know, my stepdad is paralyzed. He's wheelchair mm-hmm. bound. My mom's a carer. My wife has chronic fatigue syndrome and she's also dyslexic and she has ADHD. Mm-hmm. And I have varying shades of anxiety throughout my life and depression. And like, have I written? a mental health character into my books no I don't don't actually think I have and I'm like that is like why is that but then you know I've gone through this journey over the last year to realize that actually I haven't written many of the boxes that I tick you know I'm also a queer woman and I'm now moving into queer fiction like that is where I'm going because I'm like all I have read up until the last year was like straight white middle class actually that's Mm -hmm. not true because I I love uh, reading books written by people of color but um Mm -hmm. you know my dad is black (laughs) Mm -hmm. I just have not done justice to who I am and like that is definitely not just in internalized ableism it's just Mm -hmm. society internalized on Mm -hmm. my brain growing up in a very white middle class environment Mm -hmm. and so I you know we all have to do this work we all have to try and be better and so yeah like I definitely am trying to break down this shit yeah now so that I can write sapphic fiction like Mm -hmm. for the rest of this year like that is what I'm gonna Mm -hmm. do so yeah like but also like you do have to get over that fear and you have to yeah so what what do you say to authors who want to write you know different characters um but are afraid I think so and and I just want to like touch on one thing that you said where I think you said that you haven't like you know you you haven't read as much in like those different genres and stuff, but I think it's because of what so much of society makes most easily accessible to us, right? Like books about cis het normative relationships and stuff are, are just so front and center in in what we consume. And so like, this is the crazy thing, right? In my, in my sort of market research and like gathering of information and research mm -hmm. for young adult, like sapphic, books Mm -hmm. I scoured the market and there I have gathered a list now of about 160 books that is it and I can tell you I have gone everywhere to find books 160 there were only about 770 (laughs) odd 800 young adult LGBT books in a market where Amazon there are over 8 million books and there's like less than a thousand young adult LGBT books like what the fuck um you know like and this is what I mean so I completely agree with 
every yeah. single thing that you just said and there's the fucking evidence for it yeah right? I mean oh my god like you're like literally doing like the statistical analysis on it and like oh my god it's just so it's so fucked up because it's so not reflects reflective of what the world actually is and oh, then you have one yes truly and then you know and then you have all of these other problems with all the book banning that's going on here in the U.S. where it's like we're banning black stories and queer stories and it's like what fucking year is it mm -hmm. but yeah. And okay. So at this point, I don't remember your original question because okay. <laughs> I'm angry yeah, and I'm no, filled with rage. <laughs> um, I think it may have been, was it what mistakes do you see? Yeah. I think it was what mistakes do you see people making like when trying to write mental health? Yeah, that was it. And it was like okay. using the tropes and the stereotypes, like oh, not okay, tropes, okay. sorry, stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. And then we got, <laughs> we, we climbed on our soapboxes. <laughs> with but megaphones <laughs> yeah but seriously I mean it's so it, it oh you asked about rating different characters or like yeah that's what that's what you would the follow-up with that but yeah I think we have we historically oh, people who are afraid that was yes it. Sorry. yeah <laughs> we got there in yeah. the end <laughs> and like it, in a lot of ways it almost makes sense that like people are intimidated to take on the, these subjects because so little space has been given to them and so like you know it's valid and stuff but I think that like as as writers it's important to take you know radical steps of bravery and vulnerability and and portray characters that are very very reflective of the world around us, um, of our own lived experiences. And that doesn't mean that you have to write your own story, but you can draw from things that you, you have gone through and make it unique to that character. Um, and I, I just think that like, if you're passionate about a story being told from, from a unique perspective, there's somebody out there that not only wants to read it, but needs to read it because they need to see themselves represented in mm. literature. Like, seeing yourself in a book is such an affirming experience like I, it's just so groundbreaking and, and same with movies or television or other media that we consume like it just it really is a validating thing to to relate so fully with a character and so just go for it <laughs> I, uh, I I can't tell you how much I agree with you because I, like this so this is what's happened to me over the last year like I am a whale reader I, I don't quite read a book a day but I read over 100 books a year and wow. um over the last year like I for the, not I mean more or less for the first time kind of picked up queer fiction um, mm -hmm. and like I was having all these emotional reactions to reading and I was like damn like I haven't felt this like, oh my God, I was like yeah. really shipping the characters and like, yeah. like sobbing at the end yes. of a book or whatever. And I was like, what is with that? Like, I don't feel feelings. And um, yeah. like everyone needs to drink because I always say that I'm dead on the inside, whatever. Um, oh. Anyway, and um, and then, you know, like I'd go back to reading like my normal stuff and it'd be like, yeah, another book, another book, another book. Yeah. yeah. Like it was a real moment of clarity yeah. And, and it was literally that I was represented in those pages and like that was my love or like that was my life or like those were my experiences of homophobia or whatever mm -hmm. and um yeah like I oh god I, like uh, yeah I was kind of smiling and giggling like when you were saying about seeing yourself in a book mm -hmm. because it has been a very long time that I had spent not seeing myself in fiction and yeah I'm you know I'm a bibliophile I'm always going to read but it was a very different experience of reading when all of a sudden I started seeing myself in those pages and like now that is all I can write like I cannot write anything else other than like books about people like me so yeah, yeah I, I just hope I can <laughs> find a new, new audience but anyway there's an audience for it I'm one of them I'm in your audience <laughs> I am there <laughs> um okay writing about mental health or like mm -hmm. these experiences can be difficult mm -hmm. so like what advice do you have to authors um you know to sort of look after themselves and like whilst they're writing these difficult scenes you know I wish I wish I had a very like specific and and well thought out answer because this is actually something I've been struggling with um because I think it, it can be hard not only when you're right when you're writing you're putting you're putting pieces of yourself no matter how far removed you feel from characters you're still putting pieces of yourself onto a page right so it's like a very um it's emotionally rewarding but it's also emotionally draining it like takes a lot of emotional currency to do that um 
And then when, you know, writing about your experiences and especially hard times, it, it creates like an extra like battery drainage situation. Um, and, you know, I'm still trying to find balance too. I think it's knowing, giving yourself like grace to, mm. to step back um, from a story when, when it starts to feel too painful, because there's a difference between a story feeling cathartic um, in opening the vein sort of, and like putting your experience on the page. And then there's a point where it's like, it, it's too much. It's like you're, you're triggering or you're pushing yourself um, to a point where you don't need to go as a writer because you need to, you need to protect your mental health and you need to protect yourself first and foremost. And um you know, yeah, I, I wish I had like a very specific and clear answer because it's not it's not an easy thing to recognize and it's very easy to get caught up in your in your work too with that. Um, but yeah, I yeah, just giving yourself space when need be. So sort of looping back to some of the stuff we we mentioned earlier, um, you know, we said that one person's experience of um, say depression is not necessarily identical to somebody else's experience of depression. So how do you um, how do you tell one character's experience of like mental health or trauma or, you know, whatever, you know, anxiety without preaching or kind of suggesting that this is how everyone experiences it? I think I think you have to be intentional with the way that you write characters. Um, I think that like there's a way with your prose and like with with the character's journey and their 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 growth or like the way they come to know themselves and their and their brain better throughout the story. Um, there's a way to like honor the fact that this is their unique experience. Um, whether it's just like a couple nods to the fact that like you know, the, the character is like going through this, which, which might not be the norm, but, you know, is, is their experience or I think just leaving the door open to other people, um, have, having experiences, like having similar, like having the same, you know, mental illness, but experiencing it in a drastically different way. And I also think having, multiple characters that have a neurodiversity or have a mental illness um, kind of makes it richer and allows you to explore that nuance a little bit more. Um, I don't know, maybe it's just me. All of my friends are pretty mentally ill. Like we've all, like, you know, we've, we've all connected over our experiences with, with anxiety or depression. My best friends in the world are also autistic like me. And like, so I, you know, I think like, if you have those conversations with the people in your life, you can figure out a way to infuse that um, among your characters too, to, to demonstrate that, that nuance. Okay. Right. A complete change of subject. Now <laughs> you wrote an amazing sex scene. Uh, what, <laughs> what advice do you have for authors to help them write realistic, emotional, and a little bit raunchy sex scenes? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate that so much because that is that is so scary too. You want to talk about vulnerable? Oh my god! <laughs> oh, they're my favorite. They're my favorite I scenes. I love. The I know. Sexy I know. Scenes. <laughs> like in in book two, I wrote like a face sitting scene. Twenty five pages in, like I was just like, okay, I guess we're gonna go for it with that one. But um, <laughs> no, there's like a lot of giggling. I think, but you just. I, first and foremost, I think you have to honor what feels right for for the characters, right? Like, if your characters have like a certain personality, and all of a sudden you whip out just like I don't know, just the most random, obscure, you know, sex scene that you can think of to try to like make it spice, extra spicy, or you know, fill like a niche or a trope or something like that. It's not going to work. Like you have to honor what their sexuality and their um, just kind of their their sensuality too um, would experience. And then I also think it's really important when. Um, when writing a sex scene is you want to, again, like kind of look at it from a very sensory perspective, like mm. sex is largely a, a sensory experience. And it's also, but it also combines with oftentimes an emotional element. Um, and, and I think that's something you can play with too, if there is the emotion there, or maybe there isn't like you can, you can use that as like almost an exploratory tool too, to, to see how intimacy changes among your characters and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think taking it, um, 
taking it on an emotional level and then also infusing that with like the sensory vibe is super important and um and yeah you know what don't be afraid to just go there like you can always edit things back like go just like balls to the wall like you know get get as much out there as you want because you can edit it back and you probably will because you're going to read it and you're going to be like horrified like oh my god like what was I on that day <laughs> like you know and but but that's kind of what makes it fun and like you just look at it as like look at it as like a private moment with with you and your characters and like just let them do their thing <laughs> Yeah, and put on some like kinky music as well. Like that's yeah. one of my. Like, so I'm always like, oh yeah, let's do the Fifty Shades yeah. of Grey album. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, if you need to, like, if you need to loosen up and and you drink, like, pour a glass of wine if that helps. Like, whatever helps you. Honestly, you got to get into a sexy state of mind in order to write it. Like, if you're not, if you're not feeling sexy, like, or at least kind of embracing the general idea of it, like, it's not gonna, it's gonna feel really forced to write and it should be fun you know like if if your characters are having fun with it you should be having fun with it (laughs) exactly exactly and and I hope that sex is fun most of the time so yeah yeah (laughs) yeah. okay so before I ask you my favorite podcast question Mm -hmm. um can you recommend any books or resources for authors that would like to write about mental health well um I think so you know this is this is kind of so that's, that's a very broad question. And I think that there's like a lot of, um, amazing resources out there, um, for like just various mental, mental illnesses or neurodiversities. And like my biggest recommendation is if you are going to read a book, whether it's like, um, I don't know, self-help doesn't feel like the right word, but you know, like, I guess kind of that focus or like that lens, um, make sure it's like supported or kind of vetted by people actually in that community. Because I think like, I, I I saw a book about ADHD recently and it was written by somebody that's definitely not ADHD. And like the content in there was just like the most ableist bullshit. And it was like this, this whole, it was like a 200 page long book about how ADHD people are a burden to the not, to non ADHDers. And I was just like, this is horrifying. Like, because it, you know, it's like how to, how to restrain yourself or like how to make yourself like less gregarious and like all these very stereotypical ideas instead of being like, hey, this is, this is how your brain's wired. This is how it works. Here's how to honor it. Here's how to like make sure that you're living your best self and stuff. Um, so one book that I've read like on ADHD that helped me was, um, Queen of Distraction, I think it's called. And that just helped me like understand my wiring and how I can like just useful tips on how I can like better actually like have any executive function because I'm like, you know, virtually don't really have much. Um, and then I think just reading honestly memoirs of people that have dealt with various mental illnesses is such mm-hmm. a rich resource um to look at you know one person um whose writing I really resonated with was um Glennon Doyle and she oh oh, yeah I love 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 Glennon yeah like huge stan Uh (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes and I think that she is like her her writing is so accessible even just like her Instagram captions are like so accessible and you know she's talked about alcoholism um you know eating disorders but also anxiety depression like and she writes about it in a way that's just kind of like it, it just like makes my heart sigh in like a way that I feel seen. I don't know. So I, I, anything by Glennon Doyle, I recommend reading. Um, and then, yeah, I I would say that's kind of the best jumping off point. Um, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Well, this is the rebel author podcast. So can you tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel? I, okay. I love this question. And (laughs) I think, you know, honestly, when I, when I started writing, um, 
my my debut not so when I started writing my first book A Brush With Love um that felt very rebellious for me because it was like the first time it was the first thing I had ever done fully and unabashedly for myself like I did it just for the simple pleasure of doing it um every you know I, I leaned into tropes I was like really indulgent with prose and I had so much fun with it and it felt like it felt subversive it felt kind of like a rebellious act because I was doing something that I technically shouldn't have been focusing on at the time because I was like you know supposed to be studying 80 hours a week and blah 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 um and so yeah that was like this little rebellious action and it doesn't seem like a big thing you know in retrospect maybe but it you know it was the one thing that really kind of helped me find myself and feel very very fulfilled um and happy like writing has just made me so happy <laughs> Oh, I love that. That uh, it's funny because I um uh, I've gone through a period of like closing down projects. So, like mm-hmm. I opened too many books, I opened too many like various things that I promised other people, speaking gigs and blah blah blah. And mm-hmm. then like the last eight months, I've spent like shutting projects down because like uh, yeah, I just <laughs> went yeah. a bit nuts with opening projects. And um this past week, I got to go back to the blank page again, and oh. Like it is just ecstasy, like getting to write, write the words, get in the flow. And like, Aww. yeah, so like I completely, I, I get it. I love, I love that rebellion. Aww. Can you tell everyone where they can find out more about you and your books and like anything else that you would like to add? Yeah, I am. So my website is maisieeddings.com. Um, I don't update it as often as I should, but there is stuff on there. So at least there's that. Um, I'm fairly active on Instagram. My handle's at Maisie Eddings. And I'm also on Twitter. Um, that one is at FoxyGrandpa27. Um, we- <laughs> I, I probably should change it at, at this point. It's probably just going to stick around, but you know, regardless. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, my books can be purchased wherever books are sold as far as I know. Um, but yeah, that's not it. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a giant thank you to all of the show's patrons and all of the show's listeners. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Maisie Eddings, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Join me next week when... I can't believe I'm saying this, but I get to speak to Jessica Brody all about Save the Cat. I am sure many of you have already read either Save the Cat, the original uh, screenplay uh, book, or the more recent Save the Cat writes a novel. Uh, Jessica is also working on a new young adult version of Save the Cat as well, so we do dive into a little bit uh, about that as well. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.